Okay, is this working? Yes, okay. Um, well, I want to share with you my thoughts and progress and invite you to help me figure a lot of things out. I got started on thinking about what I call reinventing law for the commons uh, about a year ago when I kept encountering all these very highly divergent types of legal hacks in which various commons in a whole variety of different bodies of law from contract law to uh, land, land and real estate law to cooperatives to indigenous people's law and so forth, uh, were devising hacks as ways to protect the value created by their commons in the face of a body of state law that is philosophically indifferent or hostile to commons. The state law, state law historically being quite focused on uh, individual property rights, uh, economic growth, and the, the usual um, types of values. And we saw, for those of you who were in the previous session with uh, Douglas Rushkoff pointing out how the state and the market from ver the very inception in medieval times were tightly yoked together. So it shouldn't be a surprise that the law reflects those values quite deeply. And so I set about, um, first of all, itemizing five or six dozen different legal hacks around the law to say, well, how can we begin to understand these and how can we begin to devise types of law that will more effectively protect commons? And it, it be, I quickly encountered the fact that these, there's a lot of paradoxes involved because, first of all, the philosophical commitments of conventional state law versus commoning, which is sometimes informal and social and collectively oriented and not growth oriented. So this is kind of the, uh, part of the paradox we're dealing, at the dealing with. At the same time, we see how at least within internal governance, as Janelle explained in, in her efforts, uh, there are some ways to make this happen. Most of the focus of what I'm talking about is the commons relationships to state law, meaning legislatures, courts, and other uh, formal uh, laws that sanction, or for that matter, criminalize commoning. So this is, I think, part of the challenge. And I um, want to find a way to devise a body of commons-based legal inquiry that re recognizes the socio-legal political dimensions of the commons. So that's sort of the challenge. Now, we can start with a lot of familiar examples in which this has been done. Uh, I think of software immediately and something like the general public license for free software or uh, Creative Commons licenses, both of which are hacks uh, against using copyright law to invert it. Extremely ingenious and effective hacks, but nonetheless hacks because they don't, you know, first of all, they're, uh, they're not passed by a legislature. Uh, they're they're a, a license that an individual affixes to copyrighted works. And second of all, they don't really formally recognize collective interest. It's all a matter of individual choice. Nonetheless, uh, a, a, a very effective way within its, with its limits for protecting commoning in uh, intellectual property arenas. So I just wanted to give you a sense of, of, of this uh, and what I think commons-based law ought to aspire to do. Uh, first of all, it uh, necessarily, because government tends to be hostile to this, it requires a shift away from government venues to create this law. So it tends to be self uh, uh, law that originates either within the community and uh, then tries to obtain these hacks through the system, uh, as opposed to just going straight to government venues for it. Um, but I, I identified nine clusters where uh, there are forms of legal innovation going on to advance commoning. And I, without, I don't want to be too exhaustive, but I want to give you a sense of these different clusters where innovation is occurring, where I think people involved in those areas might fruitfully figure out how could we start to develop commons-based legal innovation more systematically and, and network among ourselves? Uh, so I will quickly tick through these nine clusters just to give you a sampling of a much larger group of, of, uh, of hacks. Uh, 
One is indigenous commons. You know, there's an estimated 30, 300 million indigenous people around the world, and they have their fights to achieve recognition for their commoning, for their uh, cultural identities, is really quite analogous to what a lot of other commons communities are trying to do in terms of self-determination versus state sovereignty, preserving their cultural and community traditions, uh, often against Western economic values, uh, preserving their languages and agroecological practices versus intellectual property rights and patents, uh, or uh, in many cases trying to get compensation or repatri repatriation for the theft of their collectively owned uh, property. So there's a lot of lessons I think that their fights have for other commoners. But there's at the same time some really interesting examples such as the Potato Park in Peru which is a, a sui generis legal regime where the indigenous people are the recognized legal stewards of this huge biodiversity of potatoes. Uh, and it's prevented the multinational ag biotech companies from seizing that genetic information for patents. So it, it's a, that's a really nice example of how they've, uh, as I uh, term it from uh, historical examples, beat the bounds, walked the perimeter of their shared resource to ensure its integrity and to prevent any enclosures. Uh, another indigenous uh, people's uh, innovation has been uh, the traditional knowledge digital library, where it's an, it's an India-based uh, database that has documented knowledge and usage of traditional biomedical knowledge, plants, practices, and so forth. Uh, things like yoga and the medicinal properties of the neem tree to prevent its uh, appropriation and patenting by uh, global corporations. There's a, a related uh, subsistence commons in the global south where there's a lot of innovation going on, for example, in land law in Africa, which there's a huge land rush going on in Africa where hedge funds and sovereign uh, investment funds are basically conspiring with governments to take over customarily used lands uh, and give them property deed. And the indigenous or the subsistence people have, have been there for generations, but they've not necessarily had affirmative legal recognition for their uh, use of their land. There is starting to be some change in governments starting to recognize customary rights as having standing, which is very important actually in terms of assuring uh, better ecological practices and preventing basically the enclosure, the pauperization, and the having forcing people to move to cities and uh, setting up the conditions for famines. Another uh, area within the subsistence commons is in India, they actually have a Supreme Court ruling that has formally recognized uh, the right to have commons and not ha have them not enclosed. The political and legal implications of this have not been fully grappled with, however, because it would be hugely disruptive. But it is fascinating that they've had a very starkly, clearly written uh, affirmation in 2012 of the commons and the natural resources in India. Uh, I, Another area, third area of my nine, digital commons. I don't want to go into this too much. I mentioned the, because so many of you are familiar with some of these areas, but we do have Creative Commons and GPL, but I think the open design and hardware communities are approaching a space where these kinds of innovations are, are needed to protect the integrity of, and the value of what they're uh, producing from simply being appropriated the way the large uh, corporations with capital typically do. So there's a, a whole lot of room for innovation there. We see with the blockchain ledger, the potential infrastructure for new types of algorithmic law, where you can have network-based code interacting with the authority of people who use it to create so-called smart contracts. And this is a potentially very catalytic arena where um, communities can devise their own collective law for governing themselves in, in ways that Janelle is talking about, but uh, in some ways would be more network-based. And uh, it remains to be seen how this will unfold. It's conceptually attractive. Whether it can implement with secure digital identity are some of the challenges that people are working with. A fourth area, stakeholder trust. Some of you may be familiar with the Alaska Permanent Fund as a state-chartered tr independent trust 
for managing uh, state uh, re revenues from state oil, which is then distributed to all the residents of the state every year from a huge trust fund that's now, I think, 40 or $50 billion. Uh, every resident of Alaska gets 1000 or $2,000 a year from this trust. So there's been uh, uh, a lot of suggestions, particularly from Peter Barnes, who's a, a commentator on these issues, of applying stakeholder trust to other commons-based assets, such as groundwater supplies or local forests or watersheds or uh, other things, some of which may generate revenue, some of which may not but a way of, in a long-term way, produce, uh, having a trust-based uh, responsibility and fiduciary responsibility for these assets, a way of both generating revenue while protecting the asset. Uh, there's a whole lot of uh, urban commons legal innovation going on. Some of you may have heard Chris Yoni's discussion of the Bologna regulation for the care and regeneration of urban commons, an attempt to blend city bureaucracy and governance with uh, bottom-up neighborhood and citizen group uh, projects and give that the protection of law. Uh, and I, I think there's a huge uh, uh, potential in that, but there's also lots of many imponderables about how to make it work, especially when the, cult, it's, the law, none of this law works of itself. There has to be a cultural and social buy-in to make it work. And that's actually one of the, subtle paradoxes of commons-based law, I think, in that you, law doesn't work like a machine that you just plug it in and it works. It's more of a framework for the social practices, which are often informal, uh, cultural work over time. And so finding ways to set the conditions for commenting through law, but then have people implement it, is a more subtle notion of law as opposed to simply passing a law or a regulation and having it uh, supposedly self-implement. Um, Janelle, you know, is, is on the forefront a lot of, of a lot of these efforts in trying to devise uh, uh, shareable, e shareable cities policies and platform cooperative governance regimes, which I, you know, I think are other areas that we as commoners need to be attentive to. Another area that I'll talk about briefly is new organizational forms. Uh, there's uh, a whole a couple of uh, projects that are dealing with open value networks where uh, Tiberius and uh, the Sensorica people and in Spiral are trying to develop digital platforms that facilitate new modes of open, decentralized, self-organized governance and production with social uh, dimensions to it. And I think it represents a new form of co consensual governance and production bound together through these contractual terms. But there's a lot of legal hacks that are required to make this legally recognizable by s conventional state law. Um, I won't get into too much because Janelle mentioned, but cooperative law, there are innovations there, such as multi-stakeholder multi cooperatives, which are very big in Italy and uh, Quebec and some other countries, where you don't just have worker or consumers as members of the co-ops, but citizens, volunteers, families, uh, especially for the prov providing of social services. And this is uh, a really interesting new form of of co-stewardship of common spaces and resources in healthcare, education, and uh, other social services. Again, a kind of post-bureaucratic way of meeting needs through the commons. Um, so let me just quickly wrap up by talking about some of the reflections about what these are doing. I think each of these different clusters of commons-based innovation are trying to provide a structure for internal participatory bottom-up deliberation in self-governance. They're trying to protect shared assets from enclosure. This is often, I think, the bottom line, is not, not allowing external market forces and corporations and capital to somehow uh, uh, take, the, take the resources of that commons or degrade its uh, community integrity. These le innovations are also attempting to provide a legal identity and structure uh, for the commons so that they can, ha they can, first of all, not be vulnerable to state law uh, or people who are using that law, and they can 
be uh, not criminalized the way, for example, seed sharing or file sharing is often uh, criminalized. So it's trying to uh, allow the commons to grow by having some legitimacy. And I might add that this, the, these commons innovations are trying to bridge a gap between what has been called legality and legitimacy. State law has the legality. It very often doesn't have the legitimacy. And so I think this really fills an important void, not just for the commons themselves, but societally, as state authority is often called into question, or simply can't uh, work effectively in meeting needs, whereas commons often can. Um, and I think there's also value in these legal innovations challenging the boundaries of current law and, frankly, provoking a debate. There's a whole uh, movement of community charters and uh, anti-fracking bills that, that our communities say there's no fracking allowed here. And sometimes their legal uh, enforceability is questioned, but its point is precisely to provoke a political and policy debate so that these issues can be rectified through conventional means. But ultimately, all of these uh, ideas of law for the commons are about asserting a different theory of value um, and values that conventional law and economics is not recognizing. And uh, so ultimately, this is a political struggle as well as uh, a challenge for legal innovation. And I'm, I'd like to see more focus, coordinated and activity on this front, both within individual clusters as well as more broadly to take this out of the re regime of intellectual property law, co-op law, indigenous people's law, and more generically address it as related bodies of commons-based law that need to grow together and learn from each other. Because there are things that the digital world could teach the seed sharing world and, and so on. And we need that kind of cross-fertilization to go on. So I welcome in these questions or comments ways to help advance the thinking on this because this is just my first cut on trying to uh, understand this better. So thank you.